good evening, everybody. Appreciate everyone being here this evening. We have a good, lively crowd for a Wednesday night on the first week of school. I was expecting a bunch of zombies in here, but it's not at all. That's great. I'm excited about that. Excited that we can continue our study in the resurrection of the Son of God. We were in Acts, I'm sorry, I keep on saying Acts because I think I just love Acts so much, but we're uh, in Romans 8, if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Romans chapter 8, we got through about verse 10 on Sunday morning, and leading into chapter 8 and verse 10 of Romans, Paul is describing from the preceding verses uh, this flesh versus spirit competing for our bodies. We talked about how our bodies are this, is really this battleground for flesh and spirit. And we can choose a spiritual source of life for our physical, mortal bodies. We talked about how we are spiritual when we use our bodies according to the spirit. And we are fleshly when we use them according to the flesh. We choose our source of life. Those who belong to Christ must have, must have the Spirit dwelling in them. And in the context of what Paul was talking about, this is not some miraculous falling of the Holy Spirit, some mysterious subjective indwelling. It is voluntary. And when you are in Christ, the Spirit or the breath of God breathes new life in you. Before we get to Romans chapter 8, uh, I'm sorry to keep you turning around, but go ahead and turn to Genesis 1. We, we kind of ended up on, that, on Genesis 1 on Sunday. Well, let's consider how God made man in His creation, and that will help us leading into verse 10. But before we do so, I've asked Ryan Downey to lead us in a word of prayer. God, our Father, we are so grateful to be able to come before you tonight to study your word. Father, I pray that you be with Matt as he break open the, the book of life to us to uh, talk about these most important uh, subject, the resurrection. Father, we're thankful for Jesus, thankful for his willingness to come to the cross, knowingly what was going to happen to him. Father, I just pray that we can always lean upon the Bible for our own understanding. Help us be able to discern it. Help us to understand it and apply it. Father, please watch over us during the rest of this week. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's consider how God made man in his creation in Genesis 1. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our own image, in our own likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. He created them both male and female. Then skipping down into chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. As we continue through this subject of life through the first 13 verses of chapter 8, the same way that God formed man is the same way that He will form transformed man. And this perfectly ties into chapter 8 and verse 10 of Romans, if you want to go ahead and turn there again. And Romans 8 and verse 10 is where we will start this evening. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. It's important for us to understand that Paul is making two important points regarding our resurrection. The first one is the present body that we have, the body that is dead because of sin, bringing forth literal death, Decay, mortality, is the body that will be raised, according to verse 10. 
And this parallels exactly, and this goes into point number two, this parallels exactly how this happened to Jesus. You see in verse 11, it talks about, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. The one who accomplishes the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection is the living God Himself. And we've discussed that in previous classes. We saw this in Acts 13. We saw this in Acts 2. We saw all of those statements that what God did. And we see that God raised Jesus. But here more specifically, we see the means by which this will be accomplished. And it will be through the Spirit of God. Here the Spirit is the present guarantee of our future inheritance. As Ephesians 1 and 2 Corinthians 5 mentions, this is just a taste or a deposit of what we're going to future have in our full inheritance. He's not only the spirit of life, but He's also the spirit of resurrection. Christ's resurrection is the pledge and pattern of ours. The same body or the same spirit who raised Him will also raise us. The same spirit who gives life to His body will also give life to our bodies. The same spirit who breathed life into the first Adam like we talked about in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, breathe life into the last or final Adam, the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. And here Paul makes the powerful connection that through Adam and through Jesus Christ, that same Spirit will breathe life into our mortal bodies. And with this promise of life given to us and given to our mortal bodies, Paul indicates that we have a moral obligation to the one who gives us life. If you skip down into verse 12 of Romans 8, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Remember, when you have a therefore, you need to look up to determine why it is therefore. This, person, or this point has been made in the prior classes. When those in Acts were convicted of their sins and understood that the risen Savior was reigning, what did it do to their behavior? What do we see what happened after Acts 2? What were they doing? They had all things in common. They were different people. Completely different people because they were viewing life through the lens of the resurrection, rather through death, rather than death. And the same must be said of us. Consider this quote. Hopefully you can see that. Paul's argument seems to be this. If the indwelling spirit has given life, we cannot possibly live according to the flesh, since that way lies death. How can we possess life and court death simultaneously? Such an inconsistency between who we are and how we behave is unthinkable, even ludicrous. No, we are in debt to the indwelling of the Spirit of life to live out our God-given life and to put to death everything which threatens it or is incompatible with it. I think that's a powerful quote. The idea that we're incompatible with death. In other words, life and death are set at a table before us. Paul is echoing the same message that Moses mentions in Deuteronomy like we talked about on Sunday. What does he say at, that, at, at the end of Deuteronomy to the people of Israel? What does he say? Choose, choose life. There you have before you life and death. Choose life. For God is your life. That's exactly what Paul is mentioning here. Choosing life will lead us to become sons of God. And that moves us into the next section uh, of Scripture, which is the idea of adoption in verses 14 through 17. Any comments or questions off of this so far? Okay. Let's go into verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received 
brought about your adoption to sonship, to, to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are God's children, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. So we see four characteristics of the children of God that are led by the Spirit of God. The first being that the Spirit leads us to holiness. A Spirit-led life directs us to the holiness of God. Those who choose to be led by the Spirit utilize the Spirit as their source of life. They are considered children of God. And so what would naturally come from this type of relationship? We see that we're now considered children of God. If you're a child of someone, what do you expect to receive in the future as a child? An inheritance. An inheritance. That's absolutely right. Because if you're a child of someone, then you have to be an heir. And this idea in the Greco-Roman culture of Paul's day is very interesting. Hopefully you can read that. This is from F.F. F. Bruce. The term adoption may have a somewhat artificial sound in our ears, but in the Roman world of the first century A.D., an adopted son was a son deliberately chosen by his adopted father to perpetuate his name and inherit his estate. He was, not in the smallest degree, inferior in status to a son born in the ordinary course of nature and might well enjoy the father's affection more fully and reproduce the father's character more worthily. In verse 15, we have been adopted. Those who are in Christ live intentional, spirit-led, or source lives are deliberately chosen by God, our adoptive father, to per perpetuate his great name, his holiness. We reflect his holiness and inherit something truly amazing. We're not slaves to sin anymore. We're not slaves to death anymore. We have really nothing to fear. And as he mentions, freedom replaces fear in this aspect. Since we are now sons of God, we're adopted, we now have the opportunity through our prayers through the Spirit, it prompts us to call God Abba, Father. So Abba in Aramaic, or somebody who was Jewish, what would that mean? Who would typically call somebody Abba? A child. A child would call their father that because it's a somewhat endearing term. It's almost like we use in our vernacular daddy or dada. In the and then in Greek, they would use the word, the word father, or the Greek word is pater. And so we see this inclusion of two separate nations into the family of God, the Jews and the Greeks. Since we have the privilege of being a child of God and an heir, we now have the ability to have this type of relationship with God. We need to understand that no Jew in this time would ever have dared to address God in this way. He's too holy. We, we, we can't even say His name completely. We just say Yahweh. We can't even spell His name completely. But now, this was used in a way that He is not just our Creator. Rather, He is our Father. Everything that a parent feels towards their child is exactly what God feels towards us now. And it's all contingent upon us being led by the Spirit. And then fourthly, the Spirit bears witness uh, of our hope of glory. Now this, this could mean two, two thoughts. Uh, I think you could go either way with this, but this could mean that the Spirit of God that we are being led by is demonstrated to other people in the world and to others that we come into contact with by the works of our righteousness. Uh, he mentions earlier in this chapter that we are different people. We're, we're a different person than we used to do, than what we used to be. Uh, we have put to death the misdeeds of the body, or it could mean that the Spirit is testifying or witnessing to God. 
Later in the chapter, Paul will talk about this idea about the Spirit interceding on our behalf to God. But I think the real point and the fact of this text is that if we are being led by the Spirit, we are children of God. Therefore, we are heirs with Christ. And that is a powerful statement. Any comments or questions off of that? Okay. So we're going to move into the hope section of this chapter. Verses 18 through 30. So it says in verse 17, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. Verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility or frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they have already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Let's stop right there. Paul indicates that being a Christian in this life doesn't necessarily mean that your life circumstances are going to be any better than those who are not Christians. And suffering and glory are kind of welded together. They cannot be torn apart at the, at the end of, uh, of verse 17. This idea of sharing in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. If through suffering Jesus Christ was glorified, then it must be the same experience that we must have that we must go through, this same pattern in order for us to be glorified. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 5. Go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 5. This same type of pattern of suffering and glorifying is also mentioned in 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Look in 2 Corinthians 4, in verse 16. This idea of suffering and glorification being tied together or married together. 2 Corinthians 4, in verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Verse 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. These current struggles that we go through, the uncertainties, the physical breakdown, the mental breakdown, even death, will pale into comparison of the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Like Paul says, the present cannot compare to the future, as we see in verse 18. For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. They are not comparable. Rather, they are contrastable. The magnificence of God's glory that will be, and the emphasis there is that it will be in the future, will be greatly surpassed by the difficulties of our current or the emphasis is on the present sufferings. There is going to be a glory that will be revealed in us that outweighs everything in the present right now. And we see that Paul is mentioning creation is waiting in eager expectation 
for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation he is referring to here. What, what do you think he's referring to with the idea of creation? What's the idea behind creation here? Okay. Um, maybe later in the chapter it talks about the new body. But what is he talking about specifically about creation? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're, you're right on track there. The, the idea of the beginning. Uh, the creation he is referring to here is the earth. The created universe. The animate and the inanimate. It's physical creation. The cosmos. The idea behind eager expectation that the creation is longing for. This idea of eager expectation is derived from the word kara, from the Greek, referring to the head. Hopefully you can see that. But it means to wait with the head raised and the eyes fixed on that point of the horizon from which the expected object is to come. It depicts somebody standing on tiptoe, stretching their neck, straining in order to be able to see. And that's how Paul describes the current physical creation that surrounds us today According to Paul, it's eagerly awaiting, longing, expecting something. What is the creation that is surrounding us today expecting or anticipating? I think it's what Greg just mentioned earlier. What is it expecting? For the children of God to be revealed. And we'll talk about that more of what it means to be revealed. And Paul makes three statements regarding the current creation relating to its past, its future, and its present. So the first one it talks about in the text is that the creation was subjected to frustration. I think a better translation to that is futility. Now this isn't a novel discussion that Paul is undertaking this isn't a new teaching that Paul is trying to express on his people. The current creation of God right now is cursed. It's been that way since when? Since the garden. It's been cursed since the garden. The creation after God created everything. What did he say the creation was? It was more than good. It was very good. Everything about creation was very good. Then what happened? What polluted God's creation? What made it decay? Sin. Sin, Sin was the problem. Sin was the curse. Sin pr provided the curse to the ground. And as a, resu a result of this sin, this death and decay, this decay was born. The ground is now cursed. This curse is much more than just weeds growing in our yard. This curse is much more than weeds growing in our gardens. Rather, it's a symbol of the suffering that is now evident in this earthly life. All the calamities, the wars, the pandemics, <laughs> everything is awry. This current world is not the Garden of Eden. This is not what God created. And so this ground or this earth or this creation is eagerly awaiting this idea of the longing of the children of God to be revealed. Sin has subjected creation to futility. Where have we heard that word futility before? What's another word that we could use to describe futility other than frustration? Vanity. Now, where have we heard that word from? Brother Mike Thomas. Where have we heard vanity from? Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities. That's what he talks about throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon sees that this earth is vain. And it's because of sin. Sin has made the earth futile. Sin has made the earth vanity. But we see that the hope... There's this word hope that pivots this dark reality of the past futility to the future freedom 
that creation is anticipating. He says in verse 21, he says, in hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. This subjection to futility and frustration will not last forever. Creation will experience in one of these days a new beginning. As God's creation is sharing in the suffering of God's children, it will also share in the glory of God's children. As Peter describes in 2 Peter verse 3, or chapter 3, it will be a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And this echoes the same message that perpetuates throughout the Old Testament through Isaiah and Isaiah 65. One day, order will be restored. One day, order will be restored in these times of refreshing according to Peter in Acts 3. Then we see currently, creation is growing. So we see the past futility. We see the future freedom. And now we see the present groaning of creation. He opens up to discuss three different parties that are presently groaning. First being creation, like we just mentioned. So what figure of speech is Paul pointing towards to describe the earth or the creation groaning? What is he using? Okay, he's using childbirth, but what specific literary device is he using to make this connection? Personification. So he's using personification. He's giving human qualities to non-human inanimate objects, the creation. God's creation, who has been subjected to futility, is groaning and eagerly and anxiously awaiting for what? What's, what does it say in verse 21? When the creation is brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. It is waiting for the revealing of God's children through resurrection. It's as if the creation itself is like a woman in labor. Now, uh, I don't know much about this. Uh, I was on the sidelines. Or I was an offensive coordinator when, when our boys were being born. Um, I, I have no experience in this. But the agony that a woman goes through in childbirth after the baby comes out, is it worth it? When you hold that little baby? Some may say sort of. <laughs> but usually when you hold that little baby, it's all worth it. It means, it's a means to an end. The outcome is so glorious. that uh, you, you may talk about how difficult it was later on, maybe a couple hours later, maybe a couple days later, a couple weeks later, but when you first see that baby, it takes your breath away. In verse 23, he's now, he now says we are groaning within ourselves. What are we groaning for? Maybe even a better question is, what should we be groaning for? What does it say that we, that we should be groaning for? Our adoption to sonship. We are eagerly waiting for the redemption of our bodies. What does he mean by the redemption of our bodies? Resurrection. Resurrection. The redemption of our bodies is resurrection. Our mortal bodies are going to be resurrected. Not just resuscitated so that we've got the same body, but it's a transformed body created to live in this perfected kingdom that we have already discussed. To be in the presence of God and in His holiness forever, we have to have a transformed body. Longing for our future adoption, our future bodies. One body is buried in the ground. Another transformed body is raised. As we have seen earlier in this chapter, the resurrected body will be transformed by the Spirit of God. It will be powered by the Spirit of God, adapted and able to exist with God in eternity forever. Let's look at this quote. Who can imagine a body without weakness? or infection, or tiredness, or sickness, or death, 
This is a body utterly unknown to earthly historical existence. Hopefully you can see this quote. Who can grasp what it means to live in a world entirely freed from corruption, decay, deterioration, and death? The strong constantly prey on the weak. The cycle of the seasons is a cycle of life and death. Clearly, history knows nothing of such immortal existence. Life in a world freed from corruption means nothing less than complete transformation of human historical existence as it has been known on this planet for millennia. So this begs the question, are we with our heads raised and our eyes fixed on that point of the horizon from which the expected object is to come, Are we straining, groaning, eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies? Is that what we're doing right now? Or are we too comfortable in our present circumstances? Are we too comfortable in our richness of being Americans? Maybe the question is, are we suffering? Is this world making us too comfortable? Is it making us uncomfortable. And I think this ties into exactly what Paul has been talking about throughout this chapter. Remember what he talked about in verses 5-9. through This idea of being led by the Spirit or being led by the flesh. What is your source? Is what he's describing. What is the source of life you're plugged into? Is it Spirit or flesh? And does our behavior really reflect our eager expectation? Does our behavior at work reflect this eager expectation? How about at school? How about on social media? What we post or what we tweet about or whatever we do on, on social media, is that a reflection on our eager expectation of this resurrection? Something to think about. How about in our homes? Do we talk about the resurrection? How about with our family here at West End? Are we excited? Are we eagerly awaiting this redemption of our bodies? In other words, and I think David Lanfear and I were talking about this the other night. In other words, Paul is asking, how bad do we want it? How bad do we want to have this resurrected body? That's challenging. That's challenging for us to understand how bad do we want it? How bad do we eagerly along, how eagerly, how long do we you know, wait for this type of body? In 2 Corinthians 5, go ahead and turn there. It's a companion passage to what he's describing here in Romans 8. 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 1, he says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed and said with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, bodies, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What does that sound like? That sounds like Isaiah when we talked about that idea in Isaiah 25. Verse 5, Now that the One who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. In this hope of the redeemed, transformed bodies, we are saved, according to verse 24 and 25 of chapter 8 back in Romans. The idea in verse 24, it says, For in this hope we are saved. We were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. If you're hoping for something that you're expecting God's promises to be fulfilled, well, that means you don't have it yet. If you already had it, you wouldn't be hoping for it. But currently, our faith, our hope, 
is in the redemption of our bodies in this perfected kingdom of God. That's what we hope for, what we do not yet have. Remember what he said in Romans chapter 4. Flip a couple pages over to Romans chapter 4 in verse 18. He describes his hope. He describes his hope that was revealed through Abraham. He says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Verse 20 is critical. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. The same idea is in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the confidence or the, in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Our faith, our hope, is in a redeemed body that is no longer subject to decay, but is transformed in the likeness of His Son, is rooted or founded in the faithfulness of God that He will actually do this and accomplish this. And He prescribes us to eagerly wait. And He also tells us to also do what in verse 25? We're supposed to eagerly wait, but we're also to wait patiently. So how can we marry these two ideas? Because I think this difference or this combination is significant. Now, you, you need to read this and you need to kind of wrap your head around it because it's kind of a, a riddle, in my mind at least. It says, we are to wait neither so eagerly that we lose our patience, nor so patiently that we lose our expectation, but eagerly and patiently together. We are to wait neither so eagerly that we lose our patience, nor so patiently that we lose our expectation, but eagerly and patiently together. In other words, we must have a balance in waiting for this renewal to come. Because if we lose heart, if we, if we lose focus, if we lose our eagerness, we can become apathetic, we can become stagnant, we can become lukewarm. So that's something to think about. Any comments or questions? I've been talking a lot. Or at least I feel like I've been talking a lot. No comments. Yes. You just made me think about that, that last part about eager anticipation and patience. Um, it just makes me think of how my son Thomas acts when we tell him we're going to do something. Uh, like we'll say we're going to watch a movie, and he'll get really excited, and we'll say, okay, we sit on the couch, and he'll say, watch a movie, watch a movie. And we say, okay, you got to wait. And he just sits there, and, he, and he's like, hey, you know, I'm like, okay, sit down. And you're like, so just that excitement. Like, I can't wait for it, and I, I think that's, that's a lot of it, is just keeping that excitement and keeping that anticipation, um, but realizing that we aren't the ones who decide when all this happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Any other comments? Okay, so moving into this fourth section of chapter 8, and we kind of have to speed up here a little bit. I wish we had more time to go through Romans chapter 8 because it's just a powerful message that we see in Romans chapter 8. He says in verse, let's uh, start in verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. There's the third party that's groaning. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, 
He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. I think just to kind of wrap this, this section up, there's five truths that we understand from this verse. The first one being that God works. The second one is that for the good of His own people. The third is that He does this in all things. The fourth is to those who love Him. And then the fifth being those who have been called according to His purpose. In the context of this verse, what is He talking about? Particularly in verse 18 and 17. He's talking about suffering. So this, this verse, we have to be very careful about how we define what good is. I think we need to make sure that we define what good is in God's terms and not ours. And he's reminding them of these truths in the face of suffering. And I think he's trying to make sure that they understand that all things happen to Christians. Becoming a Christian doesn't provide you immunity from bad things. Terrible things happen to good people. Terrible things happen to those who love God. And although bad things happen, we see that He says that they work for good. And we have to acknowledge that bad things are really bad things. Losing a child is a bad thing. Having to fight cancer is a bad thing. Your house burning to the studs is a bad thing. They are bad, but they are working for good. And the promise of God is not that you'll have better circumstances in this life. The promise is not if you love God, you will have better circumstances. You'll have more good things happen on this side of eternity. The promise is that God will take the bad things and work them for good. And this leads us into the final section of this chapter in verses 31 through 39. Paul says, What then shall we say in response to these things? He asks five questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously? Give us all things. In essence, he's telling us that God's not going to quit on us. Verse 33, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, and this is written in Psalm 44, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a powerful ending to this chapter. How those who will be led by the Spirit, who will live their lives as Spirit-driven people, will have their bodies redeemed and, and formed again into a transformed body. And they'll never be able to be separated from the love of Christ. They will never be able to say that death reigns, but now life reigns. Thank you.